Hello, people of YouTube. I'm Anna, aka Articulate Composed, and we're doing something a little different today. You may notice this is not a video. This is actually a podcast. Today, I have invited Jojo Funk McLovin, renowned composer, uh, author of Homestuck AU, and also just renowned shit poster in the fandom, <laughs> on today to talk about something completely unrelated to Homestuck. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about the flaws of the music education system. Some of them. <laughs> yeah. Today we're focusing on higher ed, but there are a lot of flaws in music education and how music is taught and how music should be taught. And if some of you know, I made a whole video essay a couple of years ago about the flaws of the American education system in general. And I know somebody commented asking to like talk about music education specifically and i know i noted in that comment i can't cover all of that in one video because that's so close to me personally that there's just so many flaws so yeah this is going to be a three episode mini series just sort of talking about the flaws of the music education system and what can be done to fix it so uh jojo why don't you introduce yourself yes uh, I didn't know JoJo Funk McLovin was going to be on here. I can't do this anymore. I didn't know you invited that wacko. So, a long time ago, before I got into Homestuck shit, I did music. That was my thing. That was, like, my whole identity. And I got into music first in, like, basically video game OSTs, uh, doing covers of those. But now my trajectory has changed to where I don't I barely do music anymore and I do more writing stuff. But for music, I still do the music for HSAU. I did some music for Friends Him 2. Uh, Midnight City was another game that I was working on that uh, unfortunately got canceled, but that would have been a good one. Uh, you remember Midnight City, right? Of course I do. I wrote, all the, I wrote all the incidental yes. little bleepy things. That was fun. Yeah, that's my music career is I kind of got pushed out of it just by necessity of, you know, it, it. not many people look at like original music online and the people who do are, are like the outliers. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I wish it wasn't that way uh, sometimes because I would like to post my stuff online and have it get more recognition. But you know how that is. Of course. It is exceedingly difficult to get people to click on music specifically. <laughs> yeah. Uh, especially when there's like, you know, people like uh, Home and uh, who's that other motherfucker who does like royalty free stuff? Uh, Kevin McLeod? Yeah. I don't have a problem with his music. I actually like his music. I'm so frustrated with yes. like every. I will see advertisements. Advertisements that have probably like tens of thousands at the very least poured into them, if not up to millions mm-hmm. of dollars. Using Kevin McLeod music. <laughs> like, pay a new composer Please. to write your ad music. You have the money. There's so much royalty-free shit out. I, I just, I get why they don't. I'm not, like, trying to be out here saying, hey, you should go out of your way to pay people when you don't have the money to. But uh, it is frustrating when you are essentially replaced by one royalty-free musician. I'm like, I'm not even talking small independent YouTubers. I will never fault a small independent YouTuber for not commissioning someone to write their music. But once you get to the point where you can like pay an editor on YouTube or like pay a graphic designer, like if you have the money where you can pay extra people, why not toss a couple hundred dollars towards someone to write an original theme song for you? You'd stand out more. Yeah, bespoke audio and bespoke uh, soundtracks do a lot for storytelling in my opinion, but... Um, we're not, we're not here to bash Kevin McLeod or MacLeod or however the hell you say it. Uh, we're here to bash the, uh, American education system. As always. So when it comes to education, what was your music education specifically? I did, uh, I got a free ride because I got a bunch of scholarships because I worked my ass off in high school. I was in college for four semesters at Lansing Community College. Um, I got a free ride there from a scholarship that was basically... You get free college if you go on to a big university after community college. Hmm. And so then I went on to Central Michigan University for three semesters to finish my bachelor's of composition. 
And then I freelanced in like 2020 when COVID was happening. I kind of shut down. I got I got laid off from one of my jobs and I thought, okay, this is the kick in the ass that I need to start doing music for real. And that was when I was doing my song a day project. I still can't believe you finished that. Like I can't fathom <laughs> doing something like that. It uh, Not everything was good is the secret to do, doing one of those. You got to just say, hey, this sucks, but I'm going to put it out there anyway when you do a song per day for a whole year. But then I got sick of freelancing and I just kind of quit because uh, it's a good hobby. And I poured a lot of my blood, sweat and tears into learning about it at college. But at the same time, it's it's incredibly soul sucking to be a freelancer in music because you are essentially, you know, I'm sure freelancers in animation like Felix Calgrave or other such people or freelancers in voice acting can speak to this as well. I'm not saying that music is like uniquely bad, but music is hard to freelance in because you, you really have to struggle to find work. And then you have to struggle with people over sort of a, a medium, which is, in my opinion, inherently abstract. So you'll get commissions and you'll get people saying like, hey, I want this and that. Um, I want this this song to be more sparkly or stuff like that, and it's very Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Did I ever tell you about the time that I was, I was scoring a student film? This guy, he told me he wanted urgent noir jazz. Okay. <laughs> and I wrote, I, I leaned more into the noir jazz part of it. Mm -hmm. And then I gave it to him, and he was like, oh, no, this isn't urgent enough. We can't use it. It's not urgent? <laughs> uh yeah. Whenever someone asks me that shit, I say, uh, send me like a example. Or I remember a commission I got. Someone wanted me to do some music for their D and D campaign. This was like a friend of a friend, and they said it needs to be more mysterious. And so what I did is on the master track, I just added reverb and said, "Is this good?" And they were like, "Yeah, this is perfect." <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I've started ever since the uh, urgent noir jazz one. Every time I write something new, I send a forty-five second vibe check before I continue any further. Because like, yes. if I write forty-five good, yeah. seconds of something and it's not good, and I have to scrap it, that's cool. I do not feel pain scrapping forty-five seconds of music. But if I write three minutes and I spend like a few nights on it. And then I have to scrap the whole thing? Like, no, fuck that shit. No, that's rough. But back to the education side of things. I went to Ithaca College for four years. I also got a free ride. Not because I worked my ass off, though, because my mom works there, and uh, children of faculty always get a free ride there, which is amazing. So I left Ithaca College with very little debt, which meant I was able to spend way too much money to get a master's degree in musical theater writing at NYU. And when it comes to my master's degree, I feel like I got much more out of it than I did my undergrad degree when it comes to things that are useful for the real world. Yeah, uh, I only did undergrad. I got a scholarship to do master's stuff, but I hate school, so I did not pursue that because I that sounded awful. Honestly, if you don't want to do it, don't waste the money on it. Yeah, undergrad is like... I liked undergrad a lot. I hated college. I did like my music classes. I, I am, however, pretty jaded about the actual cost of college or the utility of like being graded because most of the stuff that I learned in school, you can like basically learn on like Adam Neely right now. You, you can go on YouTube and find a guy who will say like, all right, here's the circle of fifths. Here's how it works. And if you're serious about learning it, I think that learning comes easy for people who are interested in a subject and that gives you more time to do it because you can watch the video over and over or whatever you need to i just think that any practical stuff that i learned i learned after i got out of college i actually uh i joined a, a certain music team of which i will not name and they were very harsh on me when i when i joined them because i kind of had a haughty attitude about my degree i was like i i'm hot shit because i d graduated from a, a college and, you know, I didn't know shit about mixing. I didn't know anything about producing, even though I knew a lot of stuff about, like, you know, chord progressions and, and, and notes and whatnot, to the point where they would, like, make fun of me as, <laughs> oh, oh, look at here, it's, it's the guy with the degree he doesn't know shit. And it's very humbling when you get out of school after, you know, in my case, I didn't pay, but, you know, paying a shitload of money and then getting out and realizing you suck ass. 
he might as well have not bothered. That's the thing that's so incredibly frustrating about some degree programs. So I, I've got a different opinion than you when it comes to the utility of school versus watching YouTube videos. Not everybody is great at learning from videos. I benefit really greatly from instruction, from like actually interacting with the teacher, from being able to ask questions, from being able to get hands-on help when I need it. And you're not going to get that from YouTube videos. That's true. But you are 100% correct in that this shit doesn't need to be graded. You do not no. need to grade <laughs> music. You do not, like, my, my composition lessons, like, they were quote-unquote graded in that, like, you know, you, you get the A if you show up to your lessons and show that you put effort into it. But, like... Why do you need the gradation of A through F at that point? It's like, mm -hmm. if you are studying a creative pursuit, why bother grading it? Why not just make it, oh, they showed up, they did the work, they put in effort, and they appear to be improving. Good job. You passed the class. My, my grad program was completely pass or fail. And I am so grateful it was because like, there were some songs that I'm not happy with. There were plenty of songs that I speed wrote in two nights and they turned out dreadful. They turned out embarrassing. I had to show them in front of everybody, but I didn't get a grade on them. I didn't have to add insult to injury. Like I just made a bad song and that bad song goes in the bad song hole and no one will ever hear it again. But you have to write those bad songs to be better at writing songs. Exactly. Yes. The, uh, I might have told you this story. There's a teacher that I had Shout out to Cesar Potes if you're still working at LCC or you just by fucking chance happen to listen to this. I was in his, uh, it was either songwriting or music theory where we had to make an original composition and I had clearly like rushed it like overnight because I was partying with friends or whatever. And he's this little short man. He's like, you know, five foot nothing. And I don't remember if he's from what like South American country he's from, but he's got this heavy accent and like a lot of broken English. And he just looks at me with my paper in his hands and he just goes, uh, no, this is not good. <laughs> and I remember thinking like, fuck, I'm going to get in trouble. But he gave me an extra day to work on it, which is nice. And that was one of the turning points where I realized like, oh yeah, this shit doesn't need to be graded. Like you're in a math test. Like this sucks. Just give people time to do stuff. Just instead of grading, I think the key here is instead of grading, you need feedback from either peers or mentors. And uh, for the most part, I actually feel as though I got a, a better job of that at LCC, which is a community college where a lot of people played locally. They, they were able to give much more f feedback than the people at the bigger college, Central Michigan, that I went to because Central Michigan was more focused on education than actual composition degrees, which is what I got. And so a lot of the education was geared towards uh, training teachers, which I don't have a problem with, but that was not my course. So I got a lot more out of the people who could give me functional feedback. Yeah, I feel that a lot. In my undergrad, like after freshman year, like freshman year, there was like a big group class. And then after that, you have individual lessons and your fellow students never give critique to your in-progress pieces. That was just not a thing that ever happened at my undergrad. And then in grad school, it's like, no, your, your classmates, your peers, your cohort that you're going to go off into the world and write musicals with are going to be the ones that give you the feedback. And I definitely got much more out of that. Speaking about things that are missing from a lot of conservatory educations, let's move on to the next topic, which is what was missing? What do we think we're missing from our degrees? And clearly both of us feel like uh, peer feedback was one of those things. And I want to circle back to the mixing part that you were talking about earlier when you were talking about how you were in that group and didn't know how to mix yet. Oh, yeah. So in my school, there was a like an audio engineering degree, uh, the studio recording technology major was what it was called. And if you weren't an SRT major you couldn't really take those classes. Like, the mixing classes were gatekept. And I took a film scoring class and, like, a digital music production class, but the professor specifically told us he didn't know how to mix. So I did not get any education on how to mix in undergrad, which is 
really, really harmful because if you're a composer, specifically if you're a composer that will end up working with MIDI because who can afford hiring <laughs> instrumentalists, yeah. at least when you're like submitting Pieces. Shout out to Contact. Shout out to Beast BC Orchestra. Gotta love sample libraries. Like, if you don't learn how to use those properly, they're gonna sound bad. And, like, everyone in the composition department should have been taught how to mix. And the fact that I didn't learn really until last year is horrifying. Yes, in this world, absolutely. I think the mixing thing that you're talking about is probably... To give you some idea, I used to watch the featurettes on Buffy the Vampire Slayer DVDs, which is a show that came out in, like, I think 1999, 1998, that kind of area, like, turn of the millennium. And they were already talking about how they were using digital music. So the fact that, like, in my opinion, campuses have not caught up to this, at least using a DAW or using some kind of digital tool on some very basic level that no one teaches this, is like, that sucks. Because when I got out of composition, I learned basically only things like functional harmony or chord progression or cadence, which is fine and dandy until you actually sit down to play some music and you realize, oh, my stuff sounds like garbage. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. You want to know something horrifying about just how outdated the digital music program at least accessible to composers, was at my undergrad. Yes. We did not learn Logic. Uh. We did not learn FL Studio. We did not learn, like, any DAW that anyone I know uses. We learned Digital Performer. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> it's the first DAW. It came out in the early 90s. And if you talk to a film composer that still uses Digital Performer, they're, like, at least 60 years old. Wow. And then I get to NYU and I take a film scoring class as like an elective. And uh, that's all in logic. NYU is up to speed. Ithaca College was not. Also, digital performer is so difficult to use. It is so annoying. I use uh, FL Studio and also Ableton and also GarageBand. They are kind of, it's, it's a learning curve. I think that I get why people don't teach them because it's like, yeah, you're going to have to pour like several hours into learning like the ins and outs of what the, how the hell this works. But I think if you just teach someone the basics of like, okay, here's how you equalize, here's how you compress audio, here's how you add reverb and like flavor, just the most basic shit, you can make a product at that point instead of just having a skill. And I think that at college, there is this focus on having a skill instead of crafting a finished product. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because my college education... Any given song that I'm making only gets me halfway. It only gets me to the performance. It only gets me to, you know, the notes on the page, which sounds fine and dandy. And that's definitely a difficult step that I'm glad that I learned how to do. But the rest of it, which is tinkering around with, you know, settings in FL Studio, basically mixing down your track. That's like half the work that you are no longer you, you never learned. It's incredibly frustrating how much was left out. In my notes for this podcast, I wrote down a couple of other things I feel like we're really missing. One of them being, I never learned, in my undergrad, I never learned how to write for guitar or drum kit. Which, so I am currently in the process of trying to learn how to play guitar. I am actually, by the time this podcast comes out, uh, I will have played guitar for the first time in front of other people on stream on Sunday. Hey, you come a long way. I think the last time you needed a guitar, you just said, hey, can you do this to me? Yeah. <laughs> well, I still wouldn't be able to play. I probably wouldn't be able to play the one that I asked you to play yet. I only know a handful of chords, but like, you know, I'm getting there. This is the first new instrument I've picked up since I was nine and played sax for the first time. I was never taught how to write for guitar until I got to grad school where it's like, oh, well, guitar is really common in musical theater pits, so we're going to teach you how to write for it. But in classical compositions, like, no, no, guitar is for the plebs. You're only going to learn orchestral instruments. And same with drum kit. Like, drums are so important. And, like, orchestral percussion is often pretty minimal, so they didn't even bother to teach us much when it comes to percussion and general like that was that was a point I always felt was really lacking and I asked for it multiple times like hey could we do like the entire composition studio gets together 
and the someone from the percussion department comes in and teaches us how to play all the instruments and ha- what sounds you can make out of them. Because there's so many percussion sounds and I always felt like no one was teaching me all the sounds I could make. They taught me all the sounds you could make out of a violin, but like drum kit? No, no, nothing. So that's as... as Loath I am to say, I depend on Logic Drummer for most of my songs, at least for the demos. I think that whether it be mixing, drumming, or guitaring, I think that there's just like these weird gaps. Like it's not a very holistic approach that you get in college. You you don't get, like like I was saying before, you don't get that idea of like the product. You you only, you know, sort of compose for what you know or that, that limit doesn't get pushed. I think for my money... If we're talking about what's missing from education, I think that the number one thing that I wrote, I even wrote this down on my notes here, realistic expectations. You either learn, and this might be something that you, that I have a difference with you about because you are a formal composer, but in school, I feel like you either learn either to be a formal performer or composer, an educator or an academic. And all three of those things were like, not what I wanted to do. And that's fine if that's your goal, but it wasn't mine. And if you're looking to work in like video games, film or composition, and you don't go like directly to where the, the, the money is or like the networking opportunities, like you went to NYU, I'm sure that there were a lot of networking opportunities, but I went to like Michigan, there's not really much going on there. And I think that, you know, there's an unreal expectation that you're, you're given when you sign up for a program and you say, I want to learn how to make music. And then you get pit, spit out like, all right. All right, kid, you've you've gone to school for four years. Now you know the range of a, a the comfortable playing range of a trumpet player. So, like, thing is, at NYU, so like, yeah, I did make some connections, but also at NYU, that's where we were told you're gonna have to have a survival job. But also keep in mind, I didn't get a music degree at NYU. I got a theater degree at NYU. And theater is so much more realistic about this stuff than classical music is. You, you did your undergrad for comp- composition, you said? Yeah, undergrad was composition, yeah. and uh, grad was musical theater writing. And mm-hmm. it was much more heavy on the theater than the music because it was like part of, it was part of Tisch, which was the school that had the drama department. It wasn't part of the music school at NYU. So, like, they did tell us, like, you're going to have to find a survival job. And they also, you know, told us about... Music jobs that may not be our true call, like true artistic calling, but are also something that can make you money. They told us about copy editing and helped us figure out some stuff with Finale to make it so like, hey, you can be paid to do copy editing for other people's scores. I'm real bad at score copy. I need to get better at it just for my own sake because I can't afford to pay someone. That is the opposite of my experience. I'm kind of envious. I, I'll tell you this anecdote because I think this this speaks to my experience, and I think you'll think it's funny. I uh, I had a I won't name him because um, this is not flattering to him, but I had a trombone uh, instructor when I still was a trombone instead of piano. I asked him, "Hey, how do I like start gigging? How do I start you know playing trombone at a, a venue? How do I like get into a band?" And he literally just told me. Oh, uh, you know, just just bring like your trombone case and like, you know, go on stage and ask them if you can play with them. Just like, you know, have a real book with you. And that was the most idiotic thing I've ever heard in my life. That's like the music equivalent of when your dad is like, just print out yes. your resume and give it to companies. <laughs> ask them to pl- like, to be clear, we do have a lot of like uh, bands that kind of like gig around I- in town. Like there's Frog and the Beef Tones and there's a couple other, you know, bands that just kind of do repertoire stuff so it's not like unrealistic but that was like the most in, impenetrable advice i've ever gotten in my life that's god fucking damn i i say how like my my grad school was better at being more realistic about the real world my undergrad was not everybody had to take a like career orientation class as a part of part of senior year Every, everyone's got to take this they had nothing for composers. The composition department, granted, was pretty small. It was about 20 people out of the whole music school. And that's for all four years. And there, there was a point where I was the only woman. <laughs> Love that. Yikes. But, you know, got to this career orientation class, hoping that I would learn some stuff. 
that would help me do music professionally after leaving. And it was very, very targeted, not towards the ed majors. The ed majors had their own class for uh, career stuff, which, you know, that makes sense. It was very targeted towards performers and sound recording majors with a little bit of arts administration stuff in between. But I had never learned how to do arts administration stuff. I had never learned how to mix and I sure as hell am not a performer. So that class was near useless as a composer. And the professors just sort of all assumed, they, 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 they assumed that all of us would go on to get a master's in composition and then a doctorate in composition, and then find some school to teach at for the rest of our lives, and that's how we'd get our music performed. Yes, exactly. That's what I was saying before about, you know, performer, educator, or academic. That's all they have the the prep. And that might sound like a lot of stuff, but it's really not. Because when I say performer, I mean like formal performer. I don't mean like a gig artist. And when I say educator, I don't mean like someone who makes big bank at, at like a college. I'm talking about like a high school band teacher. And when I say academic, I don't mean like, again, the big bucks. I mean like some fucking teacher who's grading papers all day from idiot kids who who like have to take your, your music history class because they are, are missing a credit. Also, you do not make the big bucks working for a university. Huh. You, you never do. Especially if you're an adjunct professor, which those are uh, illegal fucking wages. <laughs> yep. I never, I, I hated school. Ooh. I never wanted to do any of that shit. So I, I, I figured like, this is idiotic. This is my own fault for not looking at it more. I literally went to college because I thought, okay, I'll go to college. I'll graduate. There will be a step in between. And then I will become a, a video game composer. And that'll be it. And then profit. <laughs> if they don't help you connect with the people no. making video games. Like, I am currently making enough money to supplement my income to make it so I can, you know, make rent on months where my two jobs that do pay me, like, wages are tight with game composition because my girlfriend owns Studio June and I'm the person she goes to first because she knows how fast I write. Like... Once Friend Sim 2 is over, when we're between Friend Sim 2 and the next Studio June game, I don't know where I'm going to find composition freelance work. Because every freelance job I've ever had has fallen in my lap. A couple months ago, I had a mixing gig, because I guess I know how to mix now. <laughs> I had a mixing gig for a theater company that I, I'm interning with. And this mix job was not part of my internship, but uh, the guy in one of the production meetings was like talking about how desperate he was to find a fast mixer and I was like uh I can do that and he paid me 400 bucks that just it just fell in my lap and I don't know how to find other freelance work yeah I'll tell you how it's uh you have a big lap you just expand the size of your lap and you wait for things to fall into it that's it in a serious note if you do want to freelance it's basically doing bitch work forever like you will never graduate past that level because, uh, you know, you th the kind of work that you can get it nowadays is dog shit. It's like on, uh, I did work on uh, Fiverr. I did work on Video Pixie. I did work on Taxi, which is a, I don't even know what to call Taxi. It's ma mainly, mainly a scam. You pay $100 to uh, allegedly get, like, in contact with people who are going to, you know, compose for you. But, like, you never get any work. Or uh, you're going to compose four, but you never get any work. They pay, The pay is, like, insane. I got paid... My first ever job was when I was still at LCC. And this guy in Texas, he wanted a jingle for his car dealership ad. And this was a job that took me a grand total of an hour. Because he already had the lyrics and the singer had already sung it. And all I had to do was make the music for it. Very simple. It wasn't good. I really wish that I still had that. I don't know where the hell that was. That was like, it would be like six years ago now. But that was like, that was $2,000 for an hour of work. Oh, shit. And I thought, oh my God, this is great. And I never made more than like $200 ever since. So like, it, it's, it just sucks. You have to basically, half of your job as a 
no, more than half of your job, three quarters of your job as a freelancer is looking for work. That is your job as a freelancer. Because when you finally find it, the people who want your music like have no taste. They just want some corporate fucking product. Whatever you shit out for them will be fine. And that might sound easy and fun, but if you want a challenge or are you creatively inclined, it's it's a nightmare. You you want to kill yourself because it's like I have to work hard to find jobs that I don't want to do. And uh that's no good. Mm-hmm. That's why I quit freelancing because it was just a nightmare. I just started being a hobbyist again. God, yeah, that's that's fucking bleak. Oh, I wish I knew how to find those $2,000 for an hour of work kind of jobs. This was like a guy, I only talked to him over email, but even over email, I could like picture him in my brain as like a Doug Dimmodome type who doesn't know what a fuck a, a gallon of milk costs. Oh. <laughs> so he, he was just like, oh, $2,000 for your... How much could it, it's a banana, yeah, how much could it exactly. cost $15? That, that was him. He he's like straight out of Breaking Bad, like he's the banker out of Better Call Saul, wearing like a bolo tie and a cowboy hat. I think we got into what you wanted to talk about, which is what what is available but inaccessible. Yeah, the the, the mixing classes. There, you you technically could have. Uh, I knew some people who did a uh, SRT minor, and I probably would have been able to do that if I took that as a minor. But I wanted to study abroad. I wanted to go to Vienna. I wanted to go to Europe. I'm never going to go to Europe again because I'm never going to have the money. I am glad I took that opportunity. But also I wish those classes weren't gatekept for the people who made the smart decision to do the minor, you know? I think that dovetails into one of the questions you put on the discussion sheet. What wasn't necessary that you learned? Yeah. Um, Like, so my course load, I don't know how packed your course load was because especially you did it like all split up. mm -hmm. But between... The classes required for the major, the classes required for the music school, and the classes required for the school, I had 125 credits. That was over how many years? How many courses? How many semesters? Four. But like a standard degree is 120 credits. For me, it was, uh, like I said, I think every music class that I took, whether it was like, you know, music theory, songwriting, composition, whatever it was, even like oral harmony, or uh, not oral harmony, but um, the singing class you have to take, oral skills, like those were fun for me. What wasn't fun, though, is the fact that because I went to a community college and because I had to work towards a, a associate's degree, I had to be sitting there and like going to math class, like I'm in fucking high school. I had to be sitting there and like, you know, taking personal finance and shit like that. And it's a nightmare. It's It's like... I'm going to school for music, but most of my course load is uh, bullshit. Honestly, I found the classes outside the music school like a welcome break because, you know, eight to ten classes per semester. If all but one of them is in the music school, you just you get a little overwhelmed. I found it, it was a nice break to like have an English class. I, I, I was glad to like have the opportunity to read some books, <laughs> but like. I don't think I needed to take logic, not logic the daw, logic the the <laughs> fucking <laughs> logic the bullshit. Yeah, I I didn't need that class. I'm never going to think about that again. Everybody had to take like a freshman seminar and I got stuck cuz some shit happened and I got stuck with a chemistry seminar where the chemistry was like Everything I learned, not in AP chemistry, but the stuff before AP chemistry. Like, I did not need that class. That's what I got. I got stuck in, uh, here, This, this is not about music. This is just about college. How bullshit is this? Listen to this. I took AP calculus, right, in high school. So I had an AP calculus credit that I did not need to take in, in math anymore. However, at LCC, they do placement testing. And I only placed into Algebra 2, or no, I pl- I placed into Pre-Calc, which was like before the class that I'd taken. So what happened to me was I took Pre-Calc, which I had to. I skipped Calculus because I had AP Calc that I had already passed an AP class for. And then I went straight into like Calc 2. I went from Calc 1 in high school to Pre-Calc in college and then Calculus 2. And this isn't even for my fucking major, Right? This is for fun. I remember in Calc 2, I had to have uh, 
I think I had to four classes of math. I had one other than calc at some point. Why did point. you have to it take so, I had so much math? Goddamn. I only had to take one math adjacent class. General ed courses were like two thirds of my associates. It was bullshit. I don't think that's the usual experience. I think I got screwed by my counselors because they were like, well, just in case we want to, you know, keep your options open when I'm a very like, I, I knew what I wanted to do going in. I, I was not one of those people who was like, I wonder what my major will be. I wanted to do music since I was like in middle school. Let me guess. You also decided you were going to compose when you were 13 and never looked back. Well, no, here, here's what happened to me. I was like, oh, band sucks. I'm going to quit in high school when, when I when I get out of it. And then I had a band teacher. Uh, shout out to Thomas Cousineau, if you're still listening, or if you're keeping up with anything I do. This motherfucker, he was like, hey, I know, I notice you like uh, this and that composer and this and that type of thing, and, you know, here, here's some other resources that you can have, and, like, gave me a bunch of, like, CDs and, and books, and that positive reinforcement, like, ro- I, I just rode that until I got out of college. Honestly, a good teacher can change someone the course of someone's life and that's something we'll talk about more in episode two when we talk about uh music in the public education system but um so when it comes to the amount of theory do you think all of that theory is necessary now i would say all of the oral skills classes were necessary for me oh yes oral skills is your vegetables you need those you need to eat those i hated my professor she was this annoying lady, no offense if you're listening, she was this annoying lady, didn't teach very well, didn't speak English very well, uh, she was like from Germany or Poland or something, just like horrible class, but the skills that I use there, I still use today, so you need to do those, you need oral skills, no matter how much you hate them, no matter how bad your teacher is, no matter how annoying it is, you need oral skills, you need them. If you're listening to this in music school, if you hate it now, please just power through, it's very useful. My oral skills professor was... He was, like, I had the hardest one. I intentionally chose him. He was actually the father of a girl I knew growing up, which is the fun of uh, going to school in the town you grew up in. But um, I wanted him every semester because he was the one that would challenge you. And, I mean, shit, I can... Haven't done it in a little while, but, I mean, if I brushed up on it, I could definitely sight-read 12-tone shit. Like, this is important. You need the oral skills. It is vital. Uh, and it, I, I think sight singing too, more than anything, you kind of unlock like, oh, that's why music is like shaped like it is. Right. Mm -hmm. Because when you're a, especially on piano, you're like, why the fuck isn't this just like 12 tone everything? I don't get it. It's annoying. But then you read sight singing and you're like, oh, okay, I get it. Now I can like read in any key that I want just by like the, the, the way that they're shaped. Does that make sense? I'm, like, I'm sli- explaining it badly. I take it you weren't a choir kid? Uh, I did choir, but the choir that I took was bullshit. Because if you, if you grow up singing, that part's kind of innate. I feel like I had an advantage in sight singing classes because I came both from the world of band and from the world of choir. I had both the abstract press a button, it makes this sound kind of thing going on, but also the more structured music has a shape. But when it comes to theory itself, do you think everybody needs, like, no matter what your major, do you think everybody needs to learn 20th century, like, tone rows? No. (laughs) I I think this is not controversial. I think a lot of people have touched on this. But here's my problem. I like music theory. I really like, that's what got me into formal education instead of just going out and, like, you know, gigging or, or being a performer. I love music theory, but I think the music theory they teach is very different than the music theory you need. Because, for instance, here's an anecdote that I like. I had a music theory two class where we had to basically find the 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 fit the parallel fifths in a song as like an error. Right? We were basically, you know, searching for typos in in a piece. Like, where's the parallel fifths in this you know four part harmony? Or where is the non-chord tone in this counterpoint piece or something? Or where is the non-diatonic note in this part or some bullshit like that? And that was a nightmare. It was kind of annoying. It wasn't fun, but I thought it would make me better. Until I got to songwriting where we did like jazz composition for four horns and like a drum kit and a piano. 
And I was like looking at the parallel fifths and I asked my music teacher, hey, um, is this okay that I have so many parallel fifths and these other rules that I'm breaking? And he just goes, is this very, I, I wish I remembered his name because he was one of the best teachers I ever had. He, he just goes, no, <laughs> you're good. You don't need that. And I felt like both, oh, thank fucking Christ. This is not what, you know, music is going to be about, like finding typos. It's going to be about like actual creativity and, and stuff like that. But Pro tip to anyone in college for music right now. The second you leave, you will never have to worry about a parallel fifth again in your They're life. They're actually pretty fun. Parallel fifths are everywhere. Yeah, I mean, that is like the parallel fifth is actually like one of the backbones of uh, horn writing for jazz, basically. I mean, it's the power chord. It's all over rock. It's not evil. Like, whoever thought that everybody needs to... Honestly, I've, like, I had to... The hardest class I took in undergrad was a uh, 18th century counterpoint class. And I've never revisited it since then. I suppose it would end up being useful if I ever had to write, like, a pastiche of, like, some, spe like, box-specific writing. That's never come up in my post-college life. You're not out here writing fugues. I'm not out here writing fugues. <laughs> I, I guess there are some people who are out here writing fugues, but it's never come up in musical theater writing. Sure, It's sure. never come up in game composition. I can choose what musicals I want to write. Like, you are never... I mean, unless I was commissioned for a musical, which, I mean, I am not there yet. I am not at the point where people are commissioning me for musicals. You get to choose what you want to write. And if I choose... I don't want to write in the style of Bach. I don't have to pay attention to common practice rules. And the fact that everyone in music school is taught specifically common practice rules and things like jazz theory are optional. I don't think jazz theory should be optional. I think all composers should have to take jazz theory. Like the, the most useful class I took in undergrad was jazz arranging. Hands down. Yes. Oh, uh, I'm nostalgic. Oh, that was my favorite. That was like... That was probably the best time of my life, that class, because it was with that same guy who I did the songwriting class with. Because, like, jazz arranging is, like, it, it, I think jazz arranging, you sh it, they should rename it to just, like, contemporary arranging. Because you do learn a lot of jazz stuff, but I, th I think that, like, the amount of, like, harmonic depth that you can achieve, but also the way that you, the, the ease of it, basically, right? Because if you're learning 18th century counterpoint, there's all these titchy little rules and you got to learn all this stuff. But for jazz composition, it's like, hey, what if you made a chord with like a bunch of fucked up notes in it and there was like a conventional style for how to make that sound good? Like what if you had like a chord with like all 12 <laughs> or all eight diatonic notes in it, but you could make it sound good? And you can and you should. And, you know, I think Adam Neely is a great resource for anyone who wants to do this who's not in an academic setting because he has a great video, Use Ninths, Not Sevenths, that, like, opened my eyes. Or you can just look up, like, modal, uh, modal interchange. That's also very good to look up if you're a music person. I depend on modes. <laughs> like, I, I use way too much modal yes. writing. Oh, that, that, like, a world unlocks when you, like, your teacher is like, hey, you want to learn a fucked up little trick? Did you know that every scale contains every other scale? <laughs> what? Whoa. There's so many little charts that I probably still have around my room of modes. Yeah, I, I think that, like, you should just kind of go for what you want. Because there are people who, I think, because me, personally, I would have taken theory. I would have taken 18th century counterpoints. I would have done that on my own. Because I have the same interest in it as I do of, like, Shakespeare, of, like, old literature. I think that it's important to like see your roots and where music came from and sort of that thing. But the idea that it's necessary for a music education, I don't think is true. Like when it comes to required classes, I'd say 18th century counterpoint should be the optional one. Like you can take that as an elective, but then jazz theory or jazz arranging, that should be the required one. I quite agree. I think that uh, a lot of the, because a lot of my experience was, in my associate's degree, first two years, they were like, all right, here's the rules. And my second two years were basically my professors being like, there are actually no rules. Not you need to learn the rules to break them, but these rules never existed in the first place. They were like imposed by a, a, a monk. 
<laughs> and when it came to my composition lessons, there really wasn't much of a focus on the theory because, you know, it was it was it was commonly known that you don't have to obey common practice rules when you are doing contemporary classical composition. My problem with contemporary classical composition, the way it was taught at my school, was the professors had their styles. They really liked those styles, and they really wanted students to work in those styles. My professors did not know what to do when it came to musical theater. I... I will never forget this. This was um, when I was about to graduate. Uh, it was the end of semester composition department dinner. And the uh, professors were asking all the seniors, what are your plans after this? One of the guys was, he, he was planning on going off to get a master's in composition. And, you know, his final trajectory is probably going to be teaching at a university in the way that the professors wanted. And they got to me and I was like, well... I'm going to apply to schools either for a master's in film scoring or a master's in musical theater writing. And when I said musical theater writing, the professor's face. <laughs> he was so... I could smell the disappointment on him, especially because right before, right before I graduated, I had written this piece that, like, a lot of people really loved. Like, the professors loved it. The visiting group that uh, I wrote it for really loved it. The visiting... Prof uh, yeah, there was a visiting composer that weekend who really loved it. And, like, I feel like my professors, they were like, oh, wow, she's really tapped into something. She's going to be a great contemporary classical composer. And then I turn around, I'm like, no, I want to write musicals. And the other professor I had, he was actually my studio professor at that time. He was less, like, judgmental about it. But at one point, I mentioned I had been writing this musical. It was Time's Apprentice, of course. I had been telling him about it. I said that one of the songs was going to be in my senior recital. And I asked him if there was any chance that he could give me some feedback on it. And he just looked at me and he was like, I have no idea what to do with musical theater. I don't know anything about musical theater. You're on your own here. And it's like, I'm glad that he understands his limits, but also it's not that different. It's not a whole different world. It just has more to do with storytelling. Did you have to take any writing for musical theater or for musical theater? Uh, yeah. Yeah. In grad school, I took playwriting and uh, it's kind of funny. I never considered myself a writer, my whole family is writers. My dad's a poet. My mom's an essayist. My sister is in school for writing. She's actually in my mom's department, which is... I don't know if it's a bizarre experience for her or not, but um, I mean, she's taken all these classes with people that we grew up knowing because they were my mom's friends. It's kind of funny. But um, my whole family's writers. And it's like, oh, I'm the odd one out. I'm the composer. But um, a couple months ago, I had a play that I wrote, performed at a festival. I've gotten paid to write things now through Friends Some Too. I, I have now been introducing myself as a composer and playwright. Like, is, this is a bizarre experience for me because having to do with my identity. It's like now I can identify as a writer. Like, that, that's strange. I don't know. You're, um... Fuck, I was going to make a joke that you are, you're, you're Gilbert and Sullivan. There you go. There's the joke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can edit this out, right? Yeah, I, I think that, here's my thing. I think if colleges worked like they, sh they should have from the beginning, which is as like, hey, come here to learn shit, which that you, that like self-directed, where you, you, you know, you have a supervisor or you have a, someone who's mentoring you, but you still are learning in a self-directed environment and not just becoming a little automaton who does what, you know, teacher says, I think they should bring that back. And they, they still do in like masters and doctorate programs, but they need to bring it back for like undergrads. And I don't know how they're going to do that in like the economy that we have, which is basically built upon stacks and stacks of bachelor's degrees that no one needed to get. But I think that colleges should be a niche thing. You should not have to go to college. In fact, most people should not go to college because it's boring and stupid. I, I shouldn't have gone to college, but if I was going to, I would have rather gone as like a conservatory experience or a experience of uh, mentorship and connecting with people and, and uh, things like that instead of just having a counselor say, all right, you have to take these classes to graduate and uh, enjoy your next four years of high school too. I mean, I honestly kind of wonder 
if part of the problem there is also 18 year olds are not always in a place where they know what they want to learn or if they want to learn. Exactly. Like, you know, when I was in undergrad, I mean, I was glad that I had boxes to tick off because yes, I knew I wanted to compose, but also I wasn't like totally aware of what I wanted to learn yet. And I was one of the more sure people too. Like, you know, I've always known it's like, yeah, no, of course I want to go to school for composition so I can compose things, et cetera, et cetera. Imagine being 18 and you come in undeclared. You come in exploratory. Yeah. Jesus. That's, that's so bad. That's poison. You cannot do that. That's, that's not good as a society that we just have this mandatory exploratory bullshit. A lot of, a lot of people will go in and like have no idea. And if there wasn't this whole idea that you must know what you want to do next by the time you're 18, then there probably wouldn't be so many people coming in, like, completely not knowing what they want to do. Or if they want to do. 18 is too young to put pressure on kids. A lot of, well, the eight, here's my problem. 18, uh, when I was 18, I was out of the kiln, right? I, I'm done. I got leg hair. I got armpit hair. I'm growing a full beard. I know what I want to do. But like some 18 year olds, that's not how it is. You're still fuck. You're still cooking. You know, you're still in the in the oven. When I like, there's there's fucking 18 year olds that I see coming into my job now. I work uh, at a farmer's market, and they look like babies to me. They're children. They're baby faced children who don't know anything. And there's nothing wrong, let me be clear, about being a baby-faced child who doesn't know anything. We were all a baby-faced child who doesn't know anything at some point in our lives. But the idea that, like, okay, you're you're telling me that Tony Jr. has got to pick out the, his career? <laughs> That's fucked up. Let him, let him be a party animal for a little while. Let him go to bars and fuck around. Let them cook for a little while longer. You don't need to worry about that right now. Like, it sucks that there's not room for that in the economy. Like, if you don't go off to college, no. it's like, oh, well, then you gotta get a job. And fuck. what job are you gonna get when you're 18? Probably some awful retailer food service job. And then you just have your soul sucked out of you at age 18. Yeah. You, you go to work at the racism factory. Like, there should be room for people to not have to be productive. Well, Anna, I gotta, I'm going to have to put you in handcuffs now because you're, you're talking communists right now. You're talking like a damn red. <laughs> well, communism does run in my blood. My communist o meter is going off the charts that you're saying that we should, we should be able to have time for recreation. What are you, a damn socialist? Been reading the Noam Chomsky too much? I would fucking kill for, like, the smallest sprinkling of democratic socialism right now. I mean, obviously, full-on full on communism would be amazing, but we're in the U.S. We all know that's not going to happen. Just give me some fucking health care. <laughs> just, yeah, let, let an 18-year-old just, like, like, let them run up against, you know, adulthood in a controlled environment. Tell them, you know... You get one year. Here's uh, ten thousand dollars for the whole year. If you blow it, that's up to you. But uh, you know, deal with your shit. And like, that's the great thing about college is college is that transitional period. Yes, but then you gotta pay it back. I know. Like, I am very grateful. I had four years to learn how to be an adult. To like, okay, this is what it's like having roommates. This is what it's like taking care of yourself when you don't have to feed yourself and then a couple years later okay now you have to take care of yourself while feeding yourself but you still don't have to pay any bills like it's it's that slow build up and then by the time i got out of college it's like okay okay you know i'm staying at home for a year so i can save up to move to new york city but i'm going to move to new york city now cuz i know i want to live in a city and i know i want to write musicals and i know what i want to do with my life for the foreseeable future. Like, I didn't know that when I was 18. I didn't know that I wanted to live in a city specifically. And I didn't know, well, one, I didn't know that musicals were what I wanted to compose, but also like, I didn't know how to take care of myself. I still barely know how to take care of myself, but like, you know, I can feed myself. I can do laundry. I can manage care tasks while also managing having a job. And that's what those four years are there to teach you. And 
You can't just let kids loose. Okay, go work your ass off, but also never have taken care of yourself before. But also it's cruel to be like, okay, you get this transitional period, but also you're going to be in debt for the rest of your life. The, the, well, okay, if you want to get into like some deep politics here, the American government under Bush implemented what's known as No Child Left Behind. We all know the story. I'll skip over it. But after No Child Left Behind in the Obama years, I do believe, I might be incorrect, I'm a musician, not a fucking political boy, what happened was they said, okay, we're going to give schools incentives as part of this new No Child Left Behind bullshit to send kids to college. And so we're going to give schools more money if they send more kids to college. And that's why people in our generation, the sort of, you know, you and I are both like sort of fringe millennial Gen Zers. We're cuspers. Yes. We're in that 95 to 2000 range. Exactly. We're, we're the... Uh, the true millennials, if you will, where, where we actually grew up around the turn of the millennia. And we had this issue where, okay, they went all in on the college thing. You probably remember like college days at your school or saying that everyone should go to college or you need to go to college mm -hmm. or having, what was that career quest? They would say like, here's the college you need to get this job that you like. I don't know. I, I think it's like kids get pushed into college. And like I was saying before, a lot of people... They are okay. Like you said, I, th I think that you're entirely correct when you say, like, not everyone is, su is suited for this. But I think a lot of people are just suited to, you know, do their own exploring online or uh, on their own time. You know, I got a lot out of just reading books about music. Ted Joya is a great place to start if you want to learn about, like, jazz stuff, music history. That's another thing. Jazz history. I didn't take the jazz history class because I wasn't, I didn't do a jazz major. But uh, that sort of goes into the whole... Music history is so fucking white and male. So fucking white and male. There was a day where I had a really good music history professor who wanted to take to make an effort to go outside of the set curriculum to tell us about composers who weren't white and male. And there was a day where we talked about composers of color. And there was a day where we talked about women composers. And that was it. I like tried to make an effort to make all of my uh, music history projects be like female composers because you never hear about female composers except for like the three who are currently up and coming, I guess. But like, it's so white, so male. And if jazz history was required, then at least more black composers would be known. Yeah. I mean, black composers is like the entirety of, jazz composition i i have a theory this is a conspiracy theory on my part but i think that jazz composition is like as necessary as it is to like contemporary music but they still like kind of squirrel it away like because they have a separate class contemporary music and jazz composition when you really don't need a separate class for these two and i have a i have a theory that that re the reason for that is uh the old racism but that's just me oh definitely Definitely. The fact that, you know, most jazz people are uh, a black guys. Oh, no, we can't elevate the jazz composers to the same level we do Beethoven. Uh, I think we should put them past Beethoven. That motherfucker is a crusty old man in the dirt. If he heard the kind of chords they were making work, you know, if he heard Miles Davis, he'd crap his he'd crap his little fucking pantaloons. You know that uh, TikTok trend that's like... Uh, American things that would make uh, that would put a British person into a coma. Uh, there should this should be like a someone should make one where it's like jazz things that would put an 18th century composer into a coma. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite meme of that was um, someone like dressed up as George Washington with a powdered wig. It was what you said. It was like things that would shock the American founders or something. And all it was was this George Washington cosplayer saying. You freed the what? <laughs> this last point that you made, I've been dying to talk about it, the uh, elitism. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point to end this because I think that it is the shadow that is kind of hung over the rest of the things we're talking about, like why people go to college in the first place or why certain classes uh, get prioritized. And also why there's no help moving forward. What, what are your thoughts on this? I want to hear them. When it comes to contemporary classical composition, there is, well, for one, you are mostly studying 
white composers. You are mostly studying male composers. You are only studying composers who have had a conservatory education. Specifically when it comes to the no help moving forward thing, though, the things that pay are not quote unquote high art. I feel like the composing professors were more forgiving, I guess, when it came to film scoring, because, you know, a lot of film scoring is very orchestral. But like, you know, game scoring was never really something that was encouraged or like they were never like, hey, with your composition degree, you can go on to write music for X, Y, Z. It doesn't just have to be for concert. You don't just have to write for chamber ensembles or orchestras. They would never encourage that because it's not considered high art. And I've never been paid for quote unquote high art. I have never, yes, I've had some performances of my contemporary classical stuff. The year after I graduated, I went to a couple festivals. I had to pay to be in those festivals. I paid money to see people perform my stuff. One of them, I performed it myself so I wouldn't have to pay. <laughs> wow, awesome. Like, you don't get money for quote unquote high art. Orchestras are kept alive by rich old donors who only want to hear Beethoven. Th there's no kings anymore where, where they're gonna pay you to like, oh, write me a symphony. No. Yeah, no. Now the only way you get orchestral music performed is if you write a really short five minute thing and like beg an orchestra to slip it in before they play Beethoven's Ninth for the 10th time. And like other things that you can do with your music knowledge, like mixing, which I've gotten paid for. I haven't been paid an insignificant amount for mixing. That's not working on your own high art. Orchestration, I, I was paid a good chunk of change to orchestrate a musical. I should have been paid more to orchestrate that musical because uh, I didn't know my own rates at that point. But you know, helping other people arrange their work, very valuable skill. You're not working on your own high art. This is interesting because I think there are two problems with elitism. One that you can speak to, which is the sort of snooty professor types with big, you know, who drown in a, in a rainstorm because their noses are so high up. But there's also the petite elitism of, like, your fellow musicians. And this could go for, I'm sure, all kinds of art, especially digital art, where, you know, it's, it's more seen than in past eras. The sort of sm the, the elitism of like your peers who still are very precious about their material, who think they're hot shit and will critique you very harshly. I don't think there's a lot of friendship to be made in music. And that's a big problem. That's another thing. That is another thing. Biggest difference between my composition degree and my musical theater writing degree. There is no collaboration in classical composition. There is no collab. Like, it is, it is very well known. You can't write a musical alone. Even if you undertake the feat of doing book lyrics and music all by yourself, you're going to need to hire an orchestrator. You're going to need to hire a copyist. You're going to need, you, you better have a director because you can't direct your own stuff. You're going to be collaborating with actors. You're going to be collaborating with choreographers. You're, it's a collaborative process. Classical composition, the composer is God. And I hated that. I always hated putting my music, like giving my music to someone. And then they'd be like, oh, I'm going to play it exactly on the page. No interpretation. Absolutely no interpretation. I had to tell a grad student pianist, you are, you are allowed to play it how it makes you feel. And she was like, wait, no composers ever let me do that. <laughs> that sounds like a fucking dystopian novel. Like you're in a society, <laughs> no one's allowed to interpret the music. <laughs> you're, you're like the, the cute girl in like a, um, a, a divergent novel about me <laughs> composition. Oh my God. <laughs> and honestly, I think that's also part of why you're never like told what you can do with your skills moving forward. Cause it's like, okay, if you're a composer, you are a solitary composer. You may end up paying an intern one day to handle your scores, but like other than you, you write everything, you orchestrate everything. You, you have to know everything because you will do everything. And then you will one day hand your music to a conductor who will give it to his orchestra or you will hand it to your chamber ensemble and they will make this music happen and you will see your music happen and then it's set in stone and also not as not as much when it comes to drafts when it comes to editing honestly uh in musical theater you're, you're never done 
you could have a show on Broadway and you can still do edits on it. But in classical composition, it always felt like, okay, you finished this piece, you've sent it out to the world, it's done. I like the option to change things. I like the option to collaborate. I love collaborating. Like collaboration online was like my first creative love. Doing collaborations in the Homestuck fandom has always been like my first and foremost creative love. I think that uh, there is a, a sort of peer uh, elitism that I ran into, especially uh, when I was first putting my stuff out there. When, you know, I, I kind of accepted after being humbled by various projects and like kind of not stuff not panning out. I kind of accepted like, okay, I'm not as hot shit as I think I am. So I'm looking now for like some earnest feedback. So I'd put my stuff online and like there's not a lot of people who will give you like really good feedback. Um, shout out to 8-Bit Music Theory because they have a wonderful Discord channel which has a, a, a feedback or they have a wonderful Discord server with a, a re- really good feedback channel called Roast and Post which is a great way to do it where you, you have to like give feedback before you can get any. Great stuff. But what I found is like if you put stuff on YouTube or SoundCloud, people just kind of will laugh at you. People will very out of handedly just tell you 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 suck ass. And most of the time you you already know you suck ass. Like if you if you have any humility about yourself, you know. So it's very it's almost annoying to see someone say like you don't have any mastery over this. You suck. Why am I listening to you? And then you go to their page and you find out they're a musician too and their shit is no better than yours. And it's this annoying like game where you have to tear others down in order to make yourself feel better. And I see that so much in in music, especially when you're first starting out. I'm sorry, what? People have been commenting on your stuff. That's fucking awful. I've never I've never had feedback <laughs> that bad it on was, my um, stuff. I mean, my stuff doesn't go as, it doesn't hit yeah. as broad a uh, an audience as yours does. You do have many more subscribers than I do, but like, that fucking sucks. I'm sorry. I remember I posted a, a rap song that was like, just some beat that I found. Uh, I, I was on Looperman, the website. Shout out to Looperman, a great website. I just found a cool beat and I thought, okay, I, I have like a poem that I wrote. Here's the whole story. Here's what happened. This is, this is still annoying to me to this day. I posted it online. I just shat it out there. Like, I, I barely did any stuff on it. I did it in Garage Band. I didn't put any mixing. I just shat it out. And someone commented, and they said, like, this is dog shit. You suck. This should not be on YouTube. Like, you should not be making stuff. It's criminal that you get, you know, 100 views on this. Like, stop making music. And I remember... In there, they had said, like, some functional, like, tips, like, you know, this sounds bad for this reason. And I went to a group of musicians that I really, like, kind of vibed with. It was the same group of musicians that I was talking about at the beginning of the show. And I said, hey, guys, this comment made me feel bad. I think it was, like, out of pocket. I didn't like it. It made me uncomfortable. And, you know, it made me discouraged. And instead of saying, wow, I'm sorry that happened to you, JoJo, they go, well, you should be trying, you, you know, you, you should be trying to look for, you know, the positives that that guys gave you free feedback and they were telling me all this stuff. And I just it felt even worse. And that's like, you know, that that's not that's not uncommon with the other musicians that I've talked to who try to do stuff online. You just run into all this vitriol. People need to learn that it's so mean to give unsolicited. Feedback. Yes. <laughs> like. If, if, so you, if you go into a server that you know is full of musicians and you're like, hey, I wrote this, but I know it feels a little off. What would you do to make this sound better? And then the people listen to it and they're like, oh, you could add some reverb here. Oh, you could, uh, your, your bass is a little muddy. You should spread out that bass part a little bit. If you're looking for specific feedback, that's super helpful. And if you're going into a class that's specifically about getting feedback, like you're going to go in prepared. But if you post something that you're really happy with and people just post like this is shit, like what are you doing? Yeah. And like, to be clear, I was shit at the time. Like, I'm not saying that I wasn't, but that's not a good approach. Like, you're, you're not going to be good, like probably ever. Like if you're if you're an artist, you're probably never going to be good ever. And that's fine. You should not expect to be good. You should just expect to make stuff that, you know, you like. You're not going to have virtuosity. You're not going to be the next Yo-Yo Ma. You're not going to be the next John Williams. All you can do is try to trick people into thinking that you are better than you are by, like, showing competence. And that's fine. And that should be fostered. 
and that should that that's kind of to me a um a, a boon because it means you can always be improving. You can always be one percent better than you were yesterday. It means that you can look at your stuff from two years ago and instead of thinking, "Ugh, geez, I sucked. Ugh, I don't want to look at that." You think, "Wow." I'm much more skilled than my past self. That that makes me feel good. Do you ever like go back and I do this all the time where I'll go on like a, a voice nostalgia trip and I'll go into the Lotus archives and listen to like some of my first like Broadway Vriska songs and I sound like a child. Mm. It's insane. And then I'll listen to like the most recent thing I sang. It's like, okay, okay. I'm glad that I have improved significantly <laughs> in eight years of regularly recording myself. When I first turned 18... I started doing voice stuff on like uh, not safe for work homestuck things on Tumblr. Whenever I look at that, I I, I don't want to look at my old stuff. <laughs> I do look back on my old stuff and I think like, oh cool, I, I'm I'm much better now. A lot of times I find like actual a lot of like competence where I didn't think I would. Like I was saying, like if you accept that you will never be good or ex- exceptional, it takes a lot of pressure off too because then you can just kind of put whatever you want out there and you have more chances at you know hitting it big or something. You you can't be precious about your art, especially music, because no one is going to be precious about it except for you. Like, you know, Childish Gambino or or Rihanna, they are putting stuff out there and it's getting replaced in like a week. The best artists that you've ever heard in your life are 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 like expendable. If they didn't exist tomorrow, someone would fill that void. If you don't exist tomorrow, someone's going to fill that void. So the best thing you can do is just, like, have fun with it. Don't be so fucking precious about it. You're not going to be the next Beethoven. It's not, it does, it's, it's fine. Honestly, like, having a goal to be the next great insert thing here is going to destroy you. Yeah. What are you going to do when you get there? My goal when it comes to making music and making art is I want to have an effect on someone in the same way that people who I admired when I was a teenager had an effect on me. I I want to write something that is going to drive other people to write stuff. I want want to create a musical that, you know, had the same eye-opening effect about leitmotif that the score to Undertale did. Like, when I was 18, two things, like clicked into place when it came to my like desire to write things with leitmotif and that was the undertale score and hamilton and while we all have our opinions about hamilton now oh, and uh maybe <laughs> lin-manuel miranda shouldn't have written uh <laughs> fan fiction about the founding fathers because they were all slaveholders um uh, i can't deny no. that that show Lin, did why? have an effect on how i think about leitmotif so like, I want to write something that does that kind of eye-opening effect to someone else. I want to make someone gay with my art. I want to make them gay. I want to I want to make someone look at my art and think, I was not gay before. I was straight as a board. I was straight as an arrow. Now I'm gay. Not bisexual. Not, like, bi-curious. I want to make them gay. I want to make them renounce the opposite sex. And I will. And you should. And with that, why don't you tell the audience where they can find some of your music that may or may not turn them gay? Uh, if you want to be turned gay today, today, guarantee, I guarantee, uh, go to funkmclovin.bandcamp.com. You can go to youtube.com slash C slash funkmclovin and uh, look at my playlists tab. That's where my most of my music is. Um, I am also going to have a lot of stuff on Spotify along with what is up right now. My four albums um, plus soon are going to be some Homestuck albums and also some spoken content like HSAU. So yeah, that's where that's my plug. Uh, do you have a Patreon or anything? Yes, patreon.com slash McLovin. But I would rather, since you know, you're the one doing this project, I would rather they donate to you because that seems more apt fair enough uh, but if you want to give us both money i think that's that's very admirable and thank you in advance 
Well, if you do want to donate any money to me, specifically if you'd like to donate some money that would help with the production of my musical Maka, which is going on in about a month, there will be a link in the description for a GoFundMe page, but you could also toss me a Kofi. You can also, uh, honestly, go on my channel, watch videos that have ads on them, click the ads, that helps a lot. But if you wanna to listen to my music, there's plenty of my music on my channel, uh, if you want some music that you can listen to on the go very easily. My EP, Crack in the Sky, is on any streaming platform that you can imagine. Any? Uh, I think so. Nice. Except YouTube <laughs> Music, because it's already on my YouTube channel. Yeah, go, go ahead and listen to my stuff if you'd like. Uh, if you want to hear some more soundtracky stuff and less musical theater stuff, check out the Friendsim 2 soundtrack. That's uh, friendsim2.bandcamp.com. Actually, wait, or is it studiojune.bandcamp.com? Uh, it's, you'll be able to find it if you go to Studio June's website. Uh, both my music and JoJo's music are on there. You know how to use Google. Thank you all so much for listening, and we will see you all next time. All right, cool, I stopped recording. Do you, um, did you include, do you want to include, like, all of the, uh,